Well, today we are live streaming. Now, some of you know what that means. We, that means we are continuing our series that we are doing. And that series is on the eight laws of health. Now, someone's wondering, do I talk about health every week? No, if you think I talk about health every week, that means you come to church once a month. And that's only when we live stream. I don't talk about health every week. And um, in fact, I don't talk about health that much at all. Uh, it is just a series that I've decided to do on the eight laws of health. So when we are done this series, we will choose another series when we live stream. There are some pastors who preach in series all the time. And I like series, but I don't want to be uh, obligated to, to preaching all the time in a series. Let's bow our heads as we begin. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for your love to each one of us. We thank you for your watch care. We thank you for the sun that is shining a little bit today. And we thank you for the warmth of your presence. Bless us now as we uh, go into this subject. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. For those who have been following along, we have so far in this series discussed nutrition and exercise. Last year, when I spoke on the subject of health, it was from the Saginaw Church the last time, and our subject was exercise. The Lord must have heard my prayer because I've been getting plenty of exercise shoveling my driveway. Some of you know what I mean. It is good exercise. Some of you might be wondering, I thought you had a tractor for that. Yes, I do, but I don't like unnecessarily wearing the edge on my front end loader when there's only a skiff of snow. So I shovel that off by hand until I get more. Um, if you recall, the World Health Organization told us last time that physical inactivity has been identified as the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality, causing an estimated 3.2% million deaths globally. Physical inactivity. Now, I don't want to want to point any fingers. I know there's a, this subject is um, perhaps still sensitive with those of us here who have lost loved ones due to COVID, but it is a fact that those who aren't as physically healthy going into COVID are less likely to survive coming out the other side. So that is key. It's important that we look at this subject of health and exercise. All these things give us the best shot that we have when we are facing something like COVID. Exercise is defined as activity requiring physical effort carried out especially to sustain or improve health and fitness. We learned that the benefits of exercise are numerous. It improves our mood. It boosts the immune system. It increases the energy levels. It strengthens the heart and the lungs. It slows down aging. It helps you sleep better at night. It helps you think better during the day. The World Health Organization suggests that adults should get at least 30 minutes of exercise per day, five days per week. And that exercise shouldn't be in smaller than 10 minute increments. In other words, Walking from your car to the donut shop is not exercise. It has to be in greater than 10 minute increments. So if you have a real small driveway, you might have to shovel your neighbor's driveway too to get the exercise that you need. Exercise also helps us improve our spiritual well-being because we learned whatever affects the body has a corresponding effect on the what? on the mind and on the soul. That is the spiritual health of an individual. We concluded that it is important to exercise not only physically, but spiritually. First Timothy chapter four and verse eight tells us, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. Apparently, for Paul, practicing godliness was spiritual exercise. We have spiritual exercise that builds up our spiritual bodies. That spiritual exercise is called godliness. And godliness is putting into practice the light that is shining on our pathways. In other words, if we know something is right, that means we ought to put it into practice and do it. Well, today we continue with the eight laws of health taken from the ministry of healing. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, 
trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. Now, we have been going through the acronym NEW START. We have covered nutrition. We've covered exercise. What do you think the W might stand for? Water. You guys are pretty bright. S. Don't get a lot of that in Michigan this time of year. Sunlight. T. Temperance, not temptation. A. S. Pardon me, R. Rest. And what is the last one? That's right. Trust in divine power. Very good, Javen. Well, today we talk about water. Now, water is flat out amazing. Marilyn Adamson found water so incredible that she actually became a believer in God when she was an atheist, partly because of the amazing properties of water. She describes how amazing water really is. Colorless, odorless, without taste, and yet no living thing can survive without it. It has an unusually high boiling point and freezing point. Water allows us to live in an environment of fluctuating temperatures while keeping the body at a steady 98.6 degrees. Water is a universal solvent. This property of water means that various chemicals and nutrients can be carried throughout our bodies into the smallest blood vessels. Water is also chemically neutral. Without affecting the makeup of the substance it carries, water enables food, medicines, and minerals to be absorbed and used by the body. Water has a unique surface tension. Water in plants can therefore flow upward against gravity, bringing life-giving water nutrients to the top of even the tallest trees. The majority of water on Earth is salt water. But on our Earth, there is a system designed which removes salt from the water and then distributes it throughout the globe. That process is called evaporation. It takes waters from the oceans, leaving the salt. That's pretty miraculous, right? Leaving the salt behind. It evaporates and goes into clouds, which are easily moved by wind to disperse water over the land for vegetation, animals, and people. It is a system of purification and supply that sustains life on this planet, a system of recycled and reused water. In Michigan, it rains snow for many months out of the year. Snow, in unscientific terms, is frozen, aerated water. Now, if you want me to get scientific, I can. Water is made up of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Each molecule of water is made up of two hydrogen atoms bonded to a single oxygen atom, hence the chemical formulation H2O. Water has three different states. There are Florida, California, and Hawaii. No. The liquid state is Florida, California, and Hawaii. The solid state is Michigan, North Dakota, and Wisconsin, and you know, some of those. And so you have liquid, solid, and gas. So here are some pictures of water in the liquid, solid, and gas states. The liquid state you can see there is, um, you know, the water that you drink, liquid. Solid state is ice, or I guess snow, you could say. And a gas state is when you, when you see it in a, in a vapor or a mist. Now, this Earth is known by scientists, and especially those who study the cosmos, as the water planet. From space, our planet is different from any other. Viewed from space, the most striking feature of our planet is the water. In both frozen and liquid form, it covers 75% of the Earth's surface. It fills the sky with clouds. Water is practically everywhere on Earth, from inside the planet's rocky crust to inside the cells of the human body. Yet with all this water on Earth, there are 1.5 billion people of the 7 billion on the planet that don't have access to clean, safe water. In fact, 3.4 million people die every year because of water or hygiene-related causes. Credible sources tell us, and I found this hard to believe, but I researched it. Credible sources tell us that in Africa and Asia, Women and children walk an average of 3.7 miles a day for water. Now that's average. Some walk up to 9 miles a day in parts of Africa. 
The water may be closer than that, but if you have to make several trips, you know, back to the water source and back, that's what it adds up to on average, 3.7 miles a day. Think about that when you go and turn on the faucet and leave it on while you're brushing your teeth. Seems that in some cultures, people sing about water. Maybe it's because they sing about what is scarce. Some cultures, people sing the popular songs about water. Maybe that's why in, in this society we have so many love songs. People sing about what is rare, what is hard to find, hard to get. 97% of water on our planet is undrinkable because it is salt water. That is why it is possible to die of thirst on a ship in the ocean. As the poem of the ancient mariner says, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. You knew that one, Don, didn't you? You can see on the graph here that 97% of the water is where? 97% of the water is in the oceans. And I thought the lakes here in Michigan, the Great Lakes had a lot of water, but apparently 97% of water on earth is in the oceans. Of the 3% of fresh water on earth, 77% is frozen. 22% is underground, and just 1% is in lakes and streams. That's hard to believe, even with the, you know, the big great lakes that we have here. Now, not to minimize the lakes we have here in Michigan, but in the grand scheme of things, they only have a small percentage of the water or the fresh water that's in the world. The water on our earth is reused and recycled many times over. Now, when you drink water, it doesn't disappear. It eventually is recycled, and you drink it again. Maybe not you, but somebody else does. When you water your garden, it's not lost forever. The earth is a closed system when it comes to water. It doesn't escape anywhere. It doesn't leak out the bottom of the earth. It evaporates into gas, and it eventually comes down again as rain or snow, or it goes into the underground aquifers and so forth. So the amount of water on our planet is not diminishing. But the demand for good, clean water is steadily increasing. And while the Earth isn't losing water, the amount of water that is clean and drinkable is decreasing because of pollution. Is it any wonder that water is one of the eight laws of health? Today, we talk about water in the human body. Our bodies are about 60% water. Water regulates our temperature, moves nutrients through our cells, keeps our mucous membranes moist, and flushes waste from our bodies. Our lungs are 90% water. Our brains are 70% water. Our blood is more than 80% water. Simply put, we can't function without it. Most people sweat out about two cups of water per day. Each day, we lose a little more than one cup of water through our exhaling, when that is when we breathe out, we lose about a cup of water that way, and we eliminate about six cups of it. You know how. Humans use water internally and externally. First, let's talk about externally, and then we'll get to internally in a moment. This is a quote from the Ministry of Healing, page uh, 327. The health, in health and in sickness, pure water is one of heaven's choicest blessings. Its proper use promotes health. The external application of water is one of the easiest and most satisfactory ways of regulating the circulation of the blood. A cold or cool bath is an excellent tonic. Warm baths open the pores and thus aid in the el elimination of impurities. Both warm and neutral baths soothe the nerves and equalize the circulation. Have you ever known someone who didn't believe in bathing? It's not pleasant. Neither is it healthy. What would happen if you never took a bath or a shower? Beyond the immediate ramifications of losing your friends and a marked decrease in social engagements with your family, there are concerns of a more serious nature. The average body is said to have about 20 square feet of skin with about 2.6 million sweat glands. Your skin is constantly sweating, that is breathing, if you will, and it is imperative that you keep these glands and pores clean for the body to function properly. 
This is from the Ministry of Healing, page 112. Scrupulous cleanliness is essential to both physical and mental health. Impurities are constantly thrown off from the body through the skin. Its millions of pores are quickly clogged and thus kept clean by frequent bathing. Most persons would receive benefit from a cool or tepid bath every day, morning or evening. Now, I want you to just think about that statement for a moment and when it was written and how challenging it would be for people to enjoy a, a bath every day. You understand? We're talking about times when people pumped water, they hauled it by hand. It, you know, when this statement was written, it wasn't just you know, going in and turning on the shower, you understand. So those of us who have access to water, and I am going to be real giddy for a moment, I live out in the country and have my own well, so I can have as long showers as I want, and my water bill doesn't run up. Um, but whether you're, I don't think it's imperative you have long showers, <laughs> but that you cleanse yourself regularly, that's what's important. Cleanliness is so important. In the Old Testament, there were many cleansing prescriptions for various diseases, and most of them involved bathing and washing your clothes. God is a God of cleanliness. The Bible does not say that cleanliness is next to godliness, as some people mistakenly think. However, cleanliness is important. Before God met with people, with the people on Mount Sinai, you know what he did? He told them to wash their clothes and take a bath. So it's a good idea to come to church clean, neat, and tidy. That is biblical. You know, I'm getting off subject for a moment. Forgive me, but I knew of some folks who believed it was wrong to take a bath or a shower on Sabbath. And in fact, on the way to church, the car got stuck in the snow and um, they had to push it out. And the gentleman got all sweaty, so he didn't go to church because he couldn't take a bath on Sabbath, you understand. Well, I, I uh, disagree with that position, especially with the statement that Ellen White made that you know, a person could benefit from a bath every day. He didn't say except for Sabbath, of course. But I think cleanliness, our God is a God of cleanliness. And he wants us, especially when we come to church, to be neat and tidy and clean, properly bathed. Here's another statement. Persons in health should on how many accounts? No account neglect bathing. The bath is a soother of the nerves. It promotes a general perspiration, quickens the circulation, overcomes obstructions in the system, and acts beneficially on the kidneys and urinary organs. Bathing helps the bowel, the stomach, the liver, giving energy and new life to each. It also promotes digestion, and instead of the system being weakened, it is strengthened. Now, moving on from simple bathing is something called hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy or water therapy and fomentations have saved the lives of many during the plagues and influenza that swept through in the 1800s and in the 1900s. And I believe it has saved many, even from COVID. I have some friends who have practiced hydrotherapy and have overcome um, pneumonia and so forth. It is very beneficial. This may not be for everyone, but after a nice warm shower, and I like my showers hot. Anyways, it's probably not good, but I like them hot. When I'm done, I will most often end by going completely to the other end of the spectrum, completely cold. Now, that wakes the person up especially in the winter time in Michigan. It gets your circulation going. You're ready to take on the day after that. And I believe studies show that it helps your immune system ward off colds and flus. And I haven't got COVID yet, so maybe that's part of the reason, maybe. Now that we've talked about the external use of water, let's talk about the internal use. Uh, we read from page 237 from the Ministry of Healing, in health and in sickness, pure water is one of heaven's choicest blessings. Its proper use promotes health. It is the beverage which God provided to quench the thirst of animals and man. Drunk freely, it helps to supply the necessities of the system and assist nature to resist disease. We all know we ought to drink water. People have been documented to live 28, 36 
and even 40 days without food. But even in ideal conditions, you can only live, guess how long without water? Three to five days. I found that really hard to believe, but you can go and research it. Three to five days only without water. Why is that? Because your body depends on it for so many things. An animal, for instance, can lose all of its fat, about half of its protein, but if it loses as much as one-tenth of its water, it will die. About 60% of your body's weight is water. Water is crucial to keep everything working properly. It regulates and transports nutrients throughout the body. It cleanses toxins from your organs. Your body really needs to have water to survive. Now, how much water should a person drink? Well, commonly it's recommended to drink six to eight eight-ounce glasses of water per day. But that recommendation isn't based on any hard science. If you're exercising a lot, you may need a lot more. If you're working outside and it's hot out, you may need to drink a lot more. How can you know if you're drinking enough water? Well, experts tell us the best way to know is to look at your urine. If you're drinking enough water, your urine will be a more clear, light, pale color. If it's a darker yellow, that means you're not drinking enough water. A more up-to-date recommendation on how much water to drink is to uh, divide your weight in half and drink that many ounces of water. For example, if you weigh 200 pounds, you should drink 100 ounces of water, which would be 12 cups for someone who weighs 200 pounds. So if you don't want to drink so much water, you've got to lose weight, you understand. If you weigh 150 pounds, 150 pounds divided by 2, 75 ounces, divided by 8 equals 9.375. So I need to drink around 9.5 glasses of water for myself every day. Do I drink that much? No. Should I? Absolutely. Especially after preaching this sermon, I will have to put that into practice. Some time ago, there was an article in the news about this lady. Her name is Sarah Smith, 42 years old. Here's her story, and I want to share it with, to, with you in her words. She says, After years of suffering headaches and poor digestion, I spoke to a neurologist about my regular headaches and a nutritionist about my poor digestion, and both told me I should be drinking up to three liters of liquid, that's 12 cups, a day for my body to function at its best. Before this, I'd only been drinking about one liter of liquid in 24 hours, which is about four cups. She decided to take the advice of her doctors for one month and see what would happen. The photograph of me taken the day I started this trial demonstrates perfectly and rather frighteningly what a lack of hydration does to a face. I am 42, but I have to admit I more like, look more like 52 in this picture, which is shocking. There are dark shadows under and around my eyes, which make me look exhausted, a profusion of wrinkles and a strange reddish blotches, and my skin lacks any luster. It looks dead. My daughters, Alice, who is eight years old, and Betty, who is four years old, tell me I look about 100 years old in this photograph. And I have to agree. Even my lips look shriveled. This is all classic evidence of poor hydration, apparently. Every system and function in our body depends on water. It flushes toxins from the vital organs, carries nutrients to the cells, provides a moist environment for ear, nose, and throat tissues, and eliminates waste. Not drinking enough means all these functions become impaired. So I decided to see how I would look and feel if I drank three liters of water every day for 28 days. So she drank 12 cups of water a day for 28 days. The results were astonishing. I genuinely can't believe the difference in my face. I look like a different woman. The dark shadows around my eyes have all but disappeared, and the blotches have gone. My skin is almost as dewy as it was when I was a child. The transformation is nothing short of remarkable. Now, without changing anything else in her lifestyle, she lost two pounds, and her waist was an inch smaller. She also reports that her flexibility has been improved. Now, maybe you can't see the picture good enough on the screen. You could always Google Sarah Smith after church and uh, look at the picture for yourselves. 
Whether she's exaggerating, whether she's stretching things a bit, I don't know. I'll let you be the judge. But it's hard to argue with a personal testimony, isn't it? In the end of the article, she ends the article with these words, I feel fitter, leaner, and healthier, and my husband and friends tell me I look 10 years younger. Who in their right mind wouldn't want to try something like that, which gets such incredible results? Why not? So one of the eight laws of health? It's not that hard. Now, it is possible to drink too much water. People who will uh, enter drinking contests can drink too much water, and they can actually die from that because they get too much, uh, it dilutes the blood too much. It has happened several times, but that won't happen by drinking 12 cups of water a day. Somebody's bound to ask, what about coffee and Coca-Cola and caffeinated beverages? Can they help me get the water I need for the day? While they do contain water, they are still harmful. If God intended us to drink Coke and Mountain Dew and instead of water, we'd see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden drinking that stuff, wouldn't we? God is so amazing. When he gave us something to drink, he gave us something. You know how many calories, by the way, are in a medium soda at a fast food restaurant? 182 calories. How many calories in a glass of water? Zero. Doesn't have any artificial flavoring, doesn't have any artificial chemicals. I suggest that soft drinks and Coke are one of the devil's counterfeits to the beverage which God provided to quench the thirst of animals and man. Here are some reasons why you shouldn't drink Coke. Number one, in many states, the highway patrol carries two gallons of Coke in the trunk to remove blood from the highway after an accident. Number two, you can put a T-bone steak in a bowl of Coke and it will be gone in two days. Number three, to clean a toilet, pour a can of Coca-Cola in the toilet bowl and let the real thing sit for one hour and flush clean. The citric acid removes stains from the vitreous china. To remove rust spots from a chrome bumper, rub the bumper with a rumpled up piece of Reynolds wrap aluminum foil dipped in Coca-Cola. Number five, to clean corrosion from a car battery terminals, pour a can of Coca-Cola over the terminals to bubble away the corrosion. To remove grease from clothes, empty a can of Coke into a load of greasy clothes, add detergent, and run through a regular cycle. The Coca-Cola will help loosen grease stains. It will also clean road haze from your windshield. It's great stuff. We all should be using it, just not drinking it, right? What about diet soda? After all, they're mostly water too, right? True, but they still have some harmful things in them that Mother Nature intended that we should probably never be consuming. For one thing, they contain an artificial sweetener called aspartame, which has some not so good effects on human health over time. Many diet sodas also have caffeine. And to top it all off, carbonated soft drinks are high in phosphorus, a substance that hurts your body's ability to absorb calcium and weakens your bone as, bones as a result. Studies show that although diet soda has few calories, it adds belly fat and makes a person gain weight. It's hard on the kidneys and causes dental problems because it's so very acidic, it dissolves the enamel on a person's teeth. In other words, this is a commercial to drink water. Pure, clean, sparkling water. Just as in our evangelistic meetings, we tell people, there won't be alcohol in heaven, I have a suspicion there won't be Coca-Cola there either. But what will be there? Let's go to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1. Last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I can't wait to drink the water in heaven. No more pollution. Goodbye, Aquafina. Adios, Dasani. I'm going to drink the water of life. The Bible talks a lot about water. It's used for cleansing. It's used for drinking. It's used for baptism. It's used for foot washing. Probably one of the biggest water stories in the Bible comes from the Old Testament. Moses was leading the rebellious bunch of Israelites from the land of Egypt to the promised land. And one of the biggest complaints along the way was for food and what? Food and water. They complained a lot about water. Remember what God did about it? Let's go to Exodus chapter 17 and take a look. Exodus chapter 17, 
verses 2 through 7. Exodus 17, beginning in verse 2. Then the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So we called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Moses went and he struck the rock, water came gushing out. Now this is fascinating. Patriarchs and prophets tell us from the smitten rock in Horeb first flowed the living stream that refreshed Israel in the desert. During all their wanderings, wherever the need existed, they were supplied with water by a miracle of God's mercy. The water did not, however, continue to flow from Horeb, wherever in their journeys they wanted water. There, from the cleft of the rock, it gushed out beside their encampment. Isn't that incredible? In Revelation, you have the river of life. Where does it come from? Where does the river of life come from? That's right, Debbie. It comes from the throne of God. In the Old Testament, when the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was with Israel all through their wilderness wanderings, where did the water come from whenever they needed it? It came from God, did it not? Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. When I saw this passage for the first time, I remember when I read 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4 through the first time, I was amazed. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Isn't that incredible? Where did they get the water from in the wilderness? When it came out of the rock, who was that rock? It was Christ. Jesus is the rock of ages that followed them around, and from him flowed a river of life. The smitten rock was a figure of Christ. And through this symbol, the most precious spiritual truths are taught. That's why God got so upset, I guess you could say, when Moses messed things up by hitting the rock twice sometime later. As the life-giving water flowed from the smitten rock, so Christ, smitten of God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the stream of salvation flows for a lost race. It's all right to talk about water. That's good. But let me talk to you about Jesus, the rock of ages. Jesus, smitten of God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, that the streams of salvation might flow for a lost race. Talk to me about the rock of ages. As said David, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lord, that's my prayer. Is it yours? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, smitten of God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, that the streams of salvation might flow for a lost race. Lead me to the fountain that the psalmist talked about. For with you is the fountain of life. Tell me about Jesus, the rock of ages, the rock that is higher than I, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, smitten of God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, 
that the streams of salvation might flow for a lost race. Take me there. Take me to the fountain that Jeremiah talked about, the fountain of living waters. Take me to the fountain that Zechariah prophesied about, a fountain opened for sin and for uncleanness. Praise God. The point of the message today isn't to tell you to drink water. Today, I offer you the water of life. I invite you to come to the fountain that has been opened for sin and uncleanness. In the final chapter of the Bible, some of the final words the invitation is given. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Are you thirsty for the water of life? Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty? Or have you been drinking at another fountain? Quenching your thirst with the fountains of earth. Have you forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters? Jeremiah 22 verse 13 says, They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. I wouldn't travel around the world telling people to drink water. I wouldn't dedicate my life telling people to exercise. I wouldn't sacrifice to take the message of vegetarianism to the world. Because what difference does it make if I help someone become a water-drinking, exercising vegetarian if he or she is not converted. But I would travel around the world. I will dedicate my life. I will sacrifice and do all within my power to tell as many people as I can with the breath that God has given me that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain.